Good evening. I'm Sarah Churchman. Delighted to be here this evening. So, two years after Me Too, what have we learned? What progress have we made? Has anything really changed? I'd argue yes and no. What has changed? The level of awareness, awareness, who doesn't know about Me Too, who doesn't know the behaviors that it relates to, who doesn't know the groundswell of voice that was raised following the incidents that were connected with Me Too. What has not changed? <coughs> well, awareness doesn't lead to behavior change. It hasn't seen a swell in a greater sense of personal responsibility and accountability for change. We all need to drive change, particularly those in leadership roles. And I know this because I can relate it to the work that I do in the field of diversity and inclusion. What I discovered 15 years ago now was that unconscious bias awareness training, making people aware of what they're not aware of in terms of their mindset and how that drives behavior does not lead to behavior change. <clears throat> so what I want to do is to focus on four P's today. The P's stand for Project 2840, which I'll come back to to explain. I want to talk a little bit about privilege. Um, I want to talk about privilege. I want to talk about power, and I want to talk about predators. Going back as far as 2014, my organization was delighted to partner with a, um, a women's campaigning organization, a business in the community called Opportunity Now, in the largest ever research project into the experiences of women and men in the workplace. We surveyed 25,000 people, the largest ever survey, to explore their experiences of work. And the key finding, it was the biggest survey that's ever been done, the key finding, which is very pertinent, is that it's not women who need to change, it's the workplace, and indeed it's wider society to improve the experiences of women the survey found that women are confident, they're able, they're incredibly ambitious, and they want to be leaders, but they feel unsupported by their employers. And this was a cross-sectoral piece of research. That women want to work and to develop their careers. However, they're pessimistic about their chances of progression and they often felt conflicted. The nature of women's ambition, it found, was quite different to that of men's, and that flexible working wasn't helping them to progress. Indeed, the lifestyle of senior women was unattractive to them in the way it was being played out. They were hungry for role models, for people with good people skills, and for people who acted with integrity. So some great and insightful findings which many employers took away. But I think the most surprising finding or shocking finding and a key finding at the time was that bullying and harassment, including sexual harassment, was continuing in 2014 at unacceptable levels. Indeed, 52% of the women surveyed had experienced some form of sexual harassment in the workplace. So Me Too, four years on, we knew, we knew this was going on in many workplaces, in many institutions, in many organizations around the world. But as a result of Me Too, it really is out there. Why is it so rife? I think this again takes me back to the work I do on diversity and inclusion within the business world, 
We are diverse and increasingly so, but we've yet to create the culture which supports that difference, a culture that is inclusive and which people, whatever their background, feel included and that they belong. That requires a shift in mindset, it requires a shift in behavior, particularly amongst leaders who still today, we're nearly in 2020, and the Hampton Alexander report was just published last week. The majority of leaders in all walks of life remain male. And men have privilege. I'm not talking about material privilege. I'm talking about the privilege that is being a man in a predominantly male environment where you've never had to worry about your gender as being an obstacle to your ambition or your career. As Michael Kimmel, professor at Stony Brook University, describes privilege, he says privilege in the context of diversity, of diversity is invisible to those who have it. It's incredibly visible to those who don't. And with privilege, privilege associated with being in a majority group comes power, power which many take for granted, and power which often leads to the most inappropriate of behaviors and often a mindset of invincibility. And I think invincibility, which I can't quite say, um, often results in predatory behavior, inappropriate behavior that for too long has gone unchallenged. I think what Me Too has done has seen a proliferation of effort to encourage a speak up culture, a culture where everybody should be and is encouraged to be an upstander, not a bystander. We can all be an upstander and call out inappropriate behavior. I think the digital age has amplified all of this. It's one of the upsides of social media, dare I say. What Me Too has given us is a bit of a sisterhood, encouraging women to speak up and speak out and not tolerate this behavior anymore. And we need to amplify that message because there are some who still haven't heard that this is genuinely unacceptable in 2019, 2020. In my world, in the business world, where trust is at an all-time low, this is critical to our sustainability and to our purpose. Our purpose in my organization is to build trust and solve important problems. I don't think we thought equality would be such an enduring problem that is yet to be solved. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Can I invite Katie? I seem to have a, a microphone that's very high, so it'll be my <laughs> eyeball that's speaking to you this evening. <laughs> so since Me Too, I think things have changed, but not always for the better. Um, when I was growing up, harassment at school, I grew up in um, Doncaster, went to school in Rotherham, and as is now famous, harassment and sexual assault was very, very common. It was an everyday thing. In fact, it's a relatively recent revelation to me that grabbing bodies is sexual assault. I actually didn't even know that until I was in my 30s. So um, I'm sure you're all astonished that I'm in my 30s. I think that's the, the surprising takeaway from that. I'm, I think I've spoken for the group there. Um, I got my first job at a big beer company um, when I was 18, and there went into more of the same loads of, it's a beer company, loads and loads of men, and harassment was just part of the everyday occurrence of the messages that you got. And I always remember the first Christmas party that I went to there, um, a group of the managers who were all much older, I was 18, they're all much older than me, they did a bet, held a bet to see who could sleep with me. And um, one of the women managers came up to me and said, you know, this is happening, 
you probably just want to go home to your mum and dad at 18. So, and, and actually, at the time, I didn't think anything of that at all. That was just kind of a, I'm off moment. It wasn't anything. There was no kind of process for complaint. It wouldn't really have, you know, it would have been my lack of um, humour. And obviously, I've got a great sense of humour, everybody, so that's not the issue there. Um, but it would have just been, been a chip off my shoulder had I complained, and very possibly ostracised at work. So that just wasn't going to be an issue. Um, when I got into my 20s, I worked, I had, well, I worked, I had my own company. Now, it turns out, everybody, I am no Alan Sugar. It's a good job I got a job in a university, that's all I can say, because that was not good. Um, and I managed to lose um, my home, my parents' home, pretty much everything that the, re the whole of us had got. So we were very much, very much poverty-stricken at the time, homeless, we, couldn't, we'd, we were self-employed, so we couldn't get access to benefits. We were, we were really on it. Um, and somebody came to, the, to the, my apartment to value the apartment. And when your, it really was a real insight for me into the real underbelly that you only really get a glimpse of when you're absolutely desperate. And thankfully, most people don't get to glimpse that very often, but it's very much there. And the valuer came to my apartment and said, Katie, I think you're fabulous. So I'll tell you what, if you go out with me and spend the night, I'll give you what you need for this apartment. Now, bear in mind, I didn't, you know, this was, this was out of my hands, I'm bankrupt. I, I've got no, this, this is no longer my money. But that person knew that if they gave the right valuation on that apartment, that might help me to stay in it a little bit longer. So really playing on the desperation. Now, we'd not really understood my circumstances and I didn't want, it wasn't like some moral moment where not I, I was not spending the night with this man, not that. No, I just didn't need the apartment, I needed it to go. So he really not worked that one very well at all. So he was on his way. I got a job at university, started working in higher education, and I thought, oh, this is it, this is the world, this is, this is the beautiful place where everything's safe and fair and everyone knows better. I should have known better myself. Um, still, loads of harassment. It was really not great. Now, the interesting thing there is lots of processes. Lots of processes in higher education institutions. Um, processes for complaint, you know who to go to. However, those processes are often about covering backsides rather than dealing with the issue. So complaining doesn't necessarily mean that anything's going to be done. And in fact, I was given um, advice by uh, a woman professor to say, don't ever complain. It was one of the first pieces of advice she gave me as a mentor. Don't ever complain because that will stay with you and you'll be known as being a difficult person. And unfortunately, that became true as I saw. Uh, of my colleagues who, who complained about things. It still puts me too very scary to complain about harassment. There's been a lot of important focus on sexual violence in universities, and it's mainly concentrated on students post Me Too. That's really essential work. It must be done. There's loads of sexual violence. There seems to be very little attention, though, on sexual harassment and assault of staff by staff and students. There seems to be this idea that once you become a staff member, you're, you're kind of this all-powerful, incredibly, incredibly privileged person who doesn't really deal with any difficulties or trauma. And of course, that's not true. Um, so I think one effect of the marketization of higher education that I notice is that there's a lot more attention to students as customers. And so this idea of well-being takes on like a, a commodified role, really. And so there's lip service to dealing with student well-being, even if those things aren't really in place. Um, now, Sarah started uh, the discussion by talking about who doesn't know about Me Too. Well, 
I noticed from the Me Too movement that the people who probably don't know about Me Too are working class women. Um, my mother-in-law said on the phone, and my partner said to her that, okay, she's doing a talk about Me Too, and she, she had no idea what Me Too was. And that's also, I live in Doncaster, that's pretty much the kind of conversations that I have with people. Obviously, there are, there are serious limitations then of the Me Too movement, and they've been rehearsed quite a number of times now. So, you know, limitations of Me Too, it didn't include everyone. I guess no movement can. But bearing in mind that it was started by Tarana Burke, and then in true white woman fashion, it was appropriated by Alyssa Milano, who did a little follow-up tweet that didn't get half the number of retweets of the first one to say, hey, actually, this wasn't my idea, this was someone else's. Um, Me Too, I think, has told us a lot about white feminism. It was quite white women-centered, um, although the movement was nominally, nominally inclusive. You know, we had that lip service, you know, we love everyone, everyone's included. Um, lots of white women saviors talking about how they're not racist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, such as Milano. But there's very rarely within Me Too an acknowledgement of our role, white women's roles, in the violence that women of colour have faced historically and continue to face, and also our royal role in the maintenance of white supremacy. There's also scant attention to our role in the perpetuation of the idea of men of colour as sexual aggressors and predators. And I've seen that in um, my own context when I grew up in Rotherham, went to a comprehensive school in Rotherham. Um, I'm really concerned, particularly about the coverage of the stuff in Rotherham and Rochdale, that the public discourse around sexual abuse seems to have settled into this established narrative that centers on, on Islam and particularly on, on Muslim men, or rather men that we assume to be Muslim. We don't actually know. They just look Asian, so we assume that they're Muslim. It's not necessarily the case. Um, and we, we see them as, as Muslim men as like sexual predators. And this is a troublingly reductive development um, that we've seen and that is being exploited by far-right parties. It overlooks significant issues, including the widespread abuse of young women by, in Rotherham, local white men. There's lots of abuse by local white men. My friends were, um, the abuse that I saw in my year was all white men. Um, we've seen it currently with the allegations against Prince Andrew. Um, it's, it's, it's really hidden and disguised the scale and breadth of abuse and who's doing it. Um, and that's, that's also hiding the culture of classism, misogyny, and the neglect of authorities and professionals that allow systematic abuse to become prevalent and to a point unchallenged. Um, this is, I feel, I feel like this is a real injustice especially because then we deflect responsibility away from what we are doing to keep this stuff in place. Um, what we haven't listened to, what we have overlooked, the kind of assumptions we make about people um, based on their behavior or clothing or accent or skin color. Um, and we don't, we don't, and it deflects away from the people who have the power to actually identify and stop abuse, and instead it lays it on the feet of the other in society. It's a, it's a different community's problem, so that community needs to work together to overcome this, and whoo, thank goodness, we don't need to do anything. So it means that police, social workers, teachers were able to suggest that rather than being incompetent, or rather than being misogynist and classist and thinking, well, they're just a group of little slags, you know, what do you expect to happen if you knock about with older men? Rather than that, they can say, oh, do you know what? We're actually, we're just really well-meaning. We're really well-meaning. We might have done the wrong thing, might have been misguided, but we just didn't want to be racist. That's not the whole issue of what's happening. And it's dangerous if we just accept that narrative at face value. Um, let's not forget that class is the basis on which victims were identified and targeted in the sexual abuse scandals because lack of social status and lack of adult advoc advocacy 
means that any complaints that do arise aren't and weren't taken seriously. Very, very easy to dismiss. And class remains the basis on which um, class and race remains the basis on which women's um, rape women rape complainants are judged, often before the case even goes to trial, as we know. Um, if a case goes to trial, that is, and this is feeding into this into this um, idea of respectability, what it means to be respectable and therefore believable and therefore to warrant our compassion. We've seen this again with the allegations against Prince Andrew and the discussion of young women there. Um, so it's this kind of legacy, this Victorian legacy of the deserving and undeserving poor. Who merits our compassion and who doesn't? Um, the overexposure of and emphasis on British Pakistani men in uh, Rotherham and Rochdale, it's obscured the diversity of abusers and the breadth of the abuse. And it also means that fundamental lessons aren't being learned. So I've got absolutely no confidence, I'm afraid, post me too, that, the young, that young girls are safe from being groomed. I've got absolutely no confidence in that at all, because we are not recognizing the underlying misogyny, classism, and racism that is supporting and scaffolding all this. So I'm afraid I'm sure it's still happening, and it's got the potential to happen again. Finally, I just want to make the point um, of this shining survivor trope that we find in um, the current culture. It may be helpful for some to have that Christina Aguilera, thanks for making me a fighter, that thanks for domestic abuse, it's made me stronger, that kind of narrative, but actually it's really dangerous. And there needs to be a space for people who don't come out of sexual violence a better person. There needs to be a space for people who don't come from the ashes of sexual violence as a beautiful phoenix who's better than ever before. There needs to be a space for people to say, do you know what? That has ruined my life. And actually, I don't want to go out of the house. I can't do my job properly. I can't maintain a relationship. And my fear is that because, of the me because we need this kind of neat narrative arc of a beginning and a middle and an end to a story, and we want this inspirational happy ending, this triumph over adversity, that actually that's telling people that they're not good enough if they don't, if they don't triumph. There's something wrong individually with them. That, I think, is a really dangerous legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. I'm going to ask Aisha to follow on, just to say that on the back of your um, programs, there is a space. If you have a question that you would like to ask the panel, um, this is the, you know, do think as you hear our speakers speak and do jot it down, and they will be collected once all of them have spoken. And also just to say, if anything affects you this evening, do catch one of us from the cathedral uh, if you'd like to ask afterwards, Aisha. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to take part tonight. Um, and really illustrious panel of speakers really, really agree with everything that I've um, heard tonight. It's quite nice to be on a panel where you don't have to have a fake fight. Given that I do a lot of stuff on Brexit and politics, this is quite soothing. I'm off to do the leaders' debate afterwards, so this will be a bit of a rest um, before that. But look, I mean, me too. Where, where to begin? Um, such a sort of profound moment in so many ways and I think for so many women on the panel and for so many women in the audience it was a moment where for the first time it was like okay to talk about this stuff that the stuff itself wasn't shocking at all the fact that Harvey Weinstein was um you know abusing all these women and doing disgraceful things in his hotel room and all that kind of that that wasn't the surprise the surprise was that the first time we kind of got the signal that it's okay to talk about this because every single woman in this room, her mother, her sister, her best friends, will all have had an experience around um, Me Too, time, time immemorial. So 
We did think it was this moment where you know, we were going to let it all out, and, and I think that, that did happen. There was a, a period where you, you couldn't move for confessionals and testimonials from women of all different walks of life talking about the, the things and the injustices and the horrible, creepy experiences that, that they had. And you know, I, I myself, I, invite, I wrote a, a stand-up show about it last year called Girl on Girl, which was looking at how the, in my view, what happened with the Me Too movement, we had this moment where I thought all the sisterhood would come together to sort of fight the patriarchy, but actually quite a lot of the sisterhood got together and decided to fight each other about who had the best feminism and whose feminism right. And I really, really agree with your point about the, the primacy of white middle-class feminism above, above all feminism. And I too have had my own stories. I've worked in many, many different um, fields which have been incredibly male-dominated. I've worked in politics, um, work in journalism now, um, was stand-up comedian so I've really really um, when I worked in fact one of the one of my worst incidents is when I was in a car with an older boss of mine who's incredibly incredibly influential very very senior powerful man and he attacked me in the cab he tried to kiss me he tried to pull my dress down and I kind of just didn't really know what to do or say at the time I was very very junior I was making my way in an industry which is very, very hard for a person like me, a Muslim girl with no kind of connections or anything like that. And I, I didn't want to, I was just really shocked and I really didn't know what to say. So sort of none of us said anything about it. I mean, I did sort of fight him off and then I met him years later at a party. This is probably about 15 years later. I'm a completely different, you know, more mature person. And I found, and I found out he'd done this to lots of other people and I, I kind of challenged him on it. And um, I remember he said something like, you know, the weird thing is Aisha, I don't know why I, um, I did that, because I don't even normally go for darkies. But there was something about you, and I was meant to feel, I was like, who, me? Like, you know, like I was meant to feel incredibly flattered about this. And, but that was the mindset of, of, this, of this man. He actually thought he was almost being benevolent in making a pass to me, because as a woman of color, I should have been incredibly grateful to him, you know, because the type of women he would normally go for would be tall and blonde, so hey, get me, kind of thing. And also, I remember his, men his mentality was that he had worked very, very hard to get to this position of great power and great influence, and he clearly thought it was hewn into his psychology that once he got the job, and he got the bonus, and he got the corner office, he got the girls as well. It was a perk of the job. Women throwing themselves at him. I don't think they were throwing themselves at him, but that's what he kind of thought in his mind because he had power and massive, massive power. Um, and power is an aphrodisiac in the mind of lots of sort of people. He felt it was completely, absolutely acceptable to conduct himself in this way. And very occasionally, I think he did get somebody who would acquiesce to him. And he thought it was a numbers game. The more he tried it on, he might get lucky with something. So we have this incredible kind of, you know, much of the Me Too movement is not actually about the ha ha sort of side of things. It's about power. It is about power. And, and to your point, you look at the structures of power in politics, in law, in business, in the media, in medicine, every walk of life is dominated still largely by white men of privilege. And my anxiety about where the two Me, Me Too movement is, is that we all got very, very excited for a while. And we entered into this kind of festival of, of hashtag Me Too. And it was almost like the hashtag Me Too just became the panacea for everything that was going on. And suddenly feminism was trendy. Suddenly feminism was, it was like a lifestyle choice. There was like feminism, you'd have your bag with the, you know, I'm a feminist on it, loads of t-shirts. There was, you can't move for feminist festivals now. Every big company now has a, you know, empowering women conference or what do we do for more women in, in leadership? I mean, people like me do very well out of that circuit. I get, I get a lot of work out of it. But what is actually changing other than making everybody feel good for the day and making those companies feel good for the day and everybody doing a selfie and hashtag? The Me Too movement, I feel, has just become a sort of festival of kind of the hashtag selfie culture. And I will often go into these big companies and we will have the big conference about empowering women. And then I'll ask them, what's your gender pay gap? 
And they go, well, let's not talk about that because it's a, it's a very, very difficult situation, you see, because the thing is, um, there are these creatures called men and they're just at the top and the other women, they're just not there. And, and then you're like, okay, so how many women have you got on your board? Again, this is a very, very difficult thing. There's a pipeline. There's always, they go into infrastructure as a pipeline problem. You know, it's like, there really isn't a pipeline problem. There's a lot of really good women in your company if you just sort of promote them. So I feel that we've kind of lulled ourselves into a false sense of security where we're good at paying a bit of lip service service to feminism, but nobody actually wants to do the uncomfortable, difficult thing, which is move men of privilege out the way to let in women, women of color, women from different backgrounds as well. So that's why I think things have got um, a bit stuck. And I just want to um, pick up on Katie's point as well about the kind of um, white sort of middle class celebrity aspect of the Me Too movement. I feel that it has become a bit of a bandwagon for celebrity culture right now. If you are a young celebrity woman, particularly a white woman in Hollywood, you know, an up and coming actress, and you've got a big interview coming up and you want to make yourself sound incredibly woke and incredibly right on, you sort of go on about how important sort of Me Too is. But you're not actually doing anything to kind of change the industry that you're in. I mean, the cultural industries in this country, although they talk a good game on being incredibly woke, are still, again, privileged, um, white. It's very, very difficult for people from different backgrounds to, to access that. And I do feel that there's quite a cultural cleave in terms of um, what, what white middle-class women know are the boundaries, and then what what other women know are the boundaries and the ordinary lives of people. I mean, if I think about from my own culture, being from a Muslim background, this is something which is very, very hard to talk about in, in my community. And it's very easy for people to kind of have a judgy, preachy conversation with women from a Muslim background or women from a BME background saying, this is what you should be doing, this is what you should be wearing or what you shouldn't be wearing, this is what you... And it's, it's not as easy as that. You have to bring women from the real life and from different communities with you on this journey. You have to talk to them, you have to empower them, you have to understand what their lives are really, really like, where are the pressures that they are facing, the economic pressures, the cultural pressures, the career pressures, the caring pressures, the economic pressures, all those kinds of things. And that stuff is never easy. That is complicated, that is difficult, that takes hard, hard work. And a lot of this is political as well. You know, until we get the structures changed in society, the Me Too movement is just this kind of nice sort of hashtag on the side. Um, you know, your point about sort of poverty and being really, really desperate. You know, we have seen the rise of women having to turn to prostitution because of austerity affecting women so, so badly. That's something that we don't talk about. We haven't, we're in the heat of an election now. We're not talking about those kinds of pressures. The fact that actually a lot of cuts have fallen disproportionately on women who are already on the margins of society. And if you want to exploit somebody for very nefarious purposes, then you prey on those women who are absolutely on the edge. So I do think that it's, it's great to be having a conversation about this. And yes, we should celebrate Me Too as a moment where um, you know, we could speak out about this, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. We have such a long way to go. And I think sometimes we can sit back a bit and go, ha ha, you know, we've got the hashtag going, it trends a lot, it's the, the job is done, but the job is, is far from done and it is not going to be easy and it's not going to be pleasant. And just two things before I go, I mean, obviously the Prince Andrew stuff, which has really rocked everybody. Um, and the, the fact that you have one of the most educated privilege, he's got the best media advisors, the best legal advisors, the best strategic advisors, and he could not find the compassion to say sorry or to empathize with those women, those victims. And this is still a huge problem in society. And today we have another case, Julian Assange, the case has now been dropped against his allegations um, because it's basically been timed out and the, um, the claimant has gone through so much sort of mental trauma that it's, it's, it's not going to happen now, the case. And that is a, 
that is a great that is a great shame. But yet there are already prominent men, particularly on the left, who pride themselves on being the woke brothers, are tweeting, going, "Ha ha! Vindication for Julian Assange." I hope all of you who called him, um, you know, a rapist, are feeling, you know, really sort of ashamed of yourself. It's like, no, he was not acquitted. He evaded trial. So please, let's not eulogise somebody who was prepared to live in a bunker rather than face up to justice. So um, I feel I'm leaving you on a slightly depressing note, but we have got a long, long way to go. But it's really good that we can just have these conversations and be very honest about the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aisha. Can I invite uh, Chinib? Good evening, everyone. A few weeks ago, I traveled to my country of birth, Nigeria, with my family. We had a few long car journeys with drivers and armed policemen in the front, my husband, my toddler, and I in the back. On one particular occasion, we were traveling on a dusty and bumpy road, and our driver turned the radio to a talk show, a phone-in, a kind of Nigerian LBC. And I was stunned at the conversation that was being had on the airwaves a phone-in, a debate about rape culture and sexual violence. Some of the callers expressed a real concern about the prevalence of sexual harassment of women in Nigeria, while some callers put forward some shocking views suggesting that men should, should be allowed to rape their wives or that some women dress provocatively in order to get attention. Now, we've heard it all before, but during the commercial breaks, we also heard a kind of public service announcements about reporting sexual violence. In a country where there is a culture of silence about sex in general, the prevalence of this messaging showed that Nigeria is maybe having its Me Too movement, movement too. A new hashtag started there in recent months, hashtag Arewa Me Too, which comprises the Hausa term for northern Nigeria and the global hashtag we're talking about tonight. But the original creator of Arewa Me Too, Mariama Waisu, was briefly arrested by police in connection to her campaign. Now, this shows you the much more dangerous context for survivors who speak out in the global south. It's a whole different ball game. But there are signs that the Me Too movement is growing among digitally active women in the global south, those with the means by which to have a voice. In Kenya, women have started hashtag my dress is my choice protests in the streets of Nairobi after a woman was assaulted at a bus stop for wearing a miniskirt. In Senegal, two young women started Nopi Wuma, which means I will not shut up, in Wolof, to challenge Senegal's silence on gender-based violence. The campaign hashtag Doina, also in Senegal, means that's enough. The movement is growing within developing countries, but when you think of the Me Too movement, who first comes to mind? For me, it's Hollywood. It's Harvey Weinstein. It's white men who, by holding powerful positions in society, think that they have power over women's bodies. When I think of the Me Too movement, I think of Western women who quite rightly are speaking out about the sexual harassment and violence that they've faced. Now, allow me for a moment to indulge in a bit of whataboutery because I want to turn our attention for a few minutes to those whose voices will never be heard in news interviews or on social media platforms. The world's poorest and most marginalized women who face all manner of injustices and inequalities, including facing the horrors of gender-based violence. These are the ones, even in developing countries, without Instagram or Twitter handles. These are the ones facing unimaginable horrors on a daily basis. In a couple of weeks' time at Christian Aid, we'll be launching a report called War on Women, the Global Toll of Conflict and Violence, in which we'll be calling on all governments to do more to tackle the scourge of violence against women, of forced abortions, of female genital mutilation, of rape, of sexual violence in conflict and femicide. Today, 600 million women live in countries where domestic violence is not outlawed. More than 2.6 billion live in countries where rape within marriage is not a crime. At least 200 million women and girls alive today have undergone FGM. 
Adult women account for 51% of all human trafficking victims. Women and girls together account for 71%. And nearly three quarters of those trafficked women and girls are trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Now we know that women are subject to harassment and violent acts in every society in the world. The Me Too movement has highlighted the global nature of women's experiences in this area. But imagine what life must be like for those survivors who have no platform, no recourse to justice, and no dignity. Women in poverty, girls under the age of 15 experiencing sexual violence and harassment, babies. I spoke recently to Irene Wendwa, Wendwa from FEMNET, which is the African Women's Development and Communication Network. She told me that the Me Too movement globally has awakened the conversation on different forms of violence women face in different contexts. She told me about women, for example, coming from South Sudan, fleeing to other countries and seeking refuge, having been raped by rebels there. Some of these women fall pregnant following rape and then flee. They're then followed by their perpetrators who force them to have their children and are potentially force them into, into, into early marriage. I asked Irene whether the Me Too movement makes any difference to these women. And she told, me, she told me that it means something to these women when they hear through humanitarian workers that they are connected to other women through this global movement. It does make a difference to know that they are not alone. But we can't just leave it to women to make a difference for themselves. We can't solely rely on the agency of women, either in the global north or the global south, to bring about change themselves. Real change needs to happen through political and legal frameworks, through societal change that renders women's bodies no longer fair game. Governments must take seriously the, the stark reality that the world remains desperately unequal for many of the world's women, particularly those in poverty, who face a number of intersecting inequalities affecting their human rights and their ability to flourish. The pervasive nature of violence, whether it results from armed conflict committed by state actors, whether by structural violence committed by economic actors or by individuals, demonstrates how far there is to, to go before true gender equality is achieved. Despite all that the Me Too movement has done, the world's women will never be equal while vulnerable to such high levels of violence. Women face consistently unequal treatment, discrimination and denial of their human rights globally. Social norms and factors such as racial, ethnic and class discrimination make some women even more vulnerable to this violence. It manifests from the home to society, to legal and political and economic systems, and is exacerbated within conflict and violence enabling contexts. And this comes at a time of increasing impunity for the prosecution of sexual violence in many countries, including the UK. Despite Me Too, there seems to be, have been a global rollback on women's rights, such as reproductive health in many countries, underfund, underfunding of women's organizations and civil society organizations, increasing militarization and securitization by states in response to conflict. And all of this exposes women further to violence and it undermines peace building. As we mark two years since the Me Too movement was kick-started, let's remember that there is a long way to go for us and even further for the world's most marginalized women. Thank you. Thank you, Chinny. I'm gonna ask Sarah to uh, come and give our final presentation. Just do be writing your questions down and we'll get them collected after Sarah's finished speaking. We've heard this evening um, a wide spectrum of views covering um, the whole world in a sense, covering um, political, covering um, cultural, uh, poverty, we've heard about class, all kinds of uh, influences um, on the way in which women view themselves and are treated, on their aspirations uh, and on their um, future prospects. Um, I'm going to actually bring us to a rather homely example from my own perspective. 
Um, as you heard earlier, I am a, a QC, a, a barrister practicing in crime. Um, I'm also, though, I was ordained as a deacon this year, uh, and I'm currently serving as a curate, and God willing, I'll be a priest next year. And so I see um, what happens in the field of law. I see what happens in our courts, where I prosecute and defend in crimes, including honor crimes, honor killings, rape, sexual offenses, murder, domestic violence, all sorts of things, terrorism as well. Um, but I also see what happens within a church congregation, uh, within the relationships that happen there. And another hat that I wear uh, is that of being a part-time judge, and also I am chair of post-call education at Lincoln's Inn. And this is where I want to draw on a rather, perhaps, domestic example to illustrate a, a, another point, I hope. In the law, uh, in, in barristers' circles, we are all self-employed so we don't have the corporate structures that other people have. Uh, and there are tremendous advantages in that, in that we have a very collegiate way of living and working. Uh, in my role, I'm responsible for the education of uh, barristers after their call to the bar um, in their early years and on into their careers. And we at Lincoln's Inn, as in common with all the other inns, we have to um, provide compulsory training courses in advocacy for our junior barristers. And we have a cohort of 100 tutors uh, in the inn, and they give up their time for free. Uh, and we go on residential weekends in beautiful country houses, and we uh, teach, and we drink together, and we eat together. And the whole idea is that judges, uh, high court judges, junior barristers, um, senior barristers, pupils, they can all mix together um, and get to know each other. But of course, the problem with such collegiality is that um, when people are relaxing together in a rather um, holiday atmosphere, um, sometimes there can be uh, a blurring of boundaries. And when you're trying to encourage people to um, work and play together, as you might do in, in many other spheres of life without any kind of formal structure, um, that is when there can be some difficulties. Now, it came to my attention that there were concerns being expressed by some of the junior barristers, some of the younger women, uh, but the difficulty was that they were all rather uh, nebulous, they were all rather vague, it was, it was all anecdotal. Um, nobody was coming forward to say anything, it was all hearsay. I'm sorry to sound like a lawyer, but I am one. Hearsay is very difficult to act upon. Uh, and without knowing exactly how widespread a problem is, or how serious it is, or what is going on, it's very difficult then to do anything about it. Now, we have put into place um, a, a new code of conduct, um, a new process by which people can come forward and speak and make their complaints to people who are not responsible for their future careers, because you cannot expect junior people to um, complain about somebody who may have some sort of influence, whether real or perceived, um, on his or her future. So, we have a process whereby people can um, make a, a formal complaint. Uh, and we also, and a very important part of that process, um, is that that person controls precisely what will then happen to their complaint. So nobody need feel that if they come and complain that their names will be banded around, the name of the perpetrator needs to be publicized unless they choose to enter a formal complaint process. Um, by doing that, um, the hope is that we will discover um, with a great more detail and certainty um, precisely um, how widespread the difficulty is and whether we really need to be concerned about it or whether, in fact, um, the problem I I is not as great as we thought and it can be um, controlled, contained, and, of course, um, remedied so that our courses are safe for everyone. Now, the reason I raise that experience and that perspective is, is, is for this reason. Um, if a life of crime, as I have had for the past 26 years, has taught me anything, um, it is that um, a, a problem is never, can never be generalized. 
in the same way that people in prisons are often seen as being a sort of homogenous group, they're all criminals. Um, they're all criminals. But we never, unless we see them each as individuals, we never will understand how they came to be where they are um, and how best it can be that they can be rehabilitated into society. Uh, and, and one would hope um, crime prevention measures can be put into place. And it seems to me that the same thing applies to all the issues we have been hearing about this evening. Um, as many of my colleagues here have said, um, there are widespread reasons for um, abuse of women and um, harassment of women um, in, in serious, enormous, devastating ways, uh, and in at the other end of the scale, just irritants. So, for example, um, when I first, I was a banker before I came to the bar, uh, and uh, many years ago, 30 years ago, I'd be routinely asked when I went to work um, what color my underwear was on that day. And this was just thought to be sort of vaguely amusing. Um, I was horrified when I declined to answer one day, and I was told, well, don't worry, three or four of us will make sure at the uh, Christmas party that we find out what color your underwear is. Um, I believe we've come some way since then in some areas, uh, but there are many other areas of, of our uh, domestic situation here and internationally where we have a long way yet to go. But it seems to me that we have to be very careful about generalizing, which is why I go back to my example of Lincoln's Inn and the anecdotal evidence. And until we know precisely what is happening, until we know why it is happening, until we address individual cases and individual causes, it seems to me that we will never do more, really, than wring our hands uh, and uh, worry and rail at the injustices of the world. So, yes, there, there, may, be, um, there may be cultural reasons, poverty, plays an enormous part in some situations. But I don't believe that sexual harassment is any, um, that there is no one size fits all. There is no one place where you find it and another place where you don't. Uh, and to address it and root it out, you need to approach it in different ways and, and find out in the different spheres um, what is happening. This will take an enormous amount of uh, research and an enormous amount of listening to different perspectives. So we need to be aware of anecdotal evidence. We need to be aware of generalizing. It seems to me also that we need to rejoice in how far we have come thus far. Um, inequalities, of course, still exist. But let's look at back at how it used to be. Not only my example and those of my colleagues here about how women um, might have had experiences 30 years ago, but of, of, of how much we are now aware of these problems and these issues. Of course, we have a long way yet to go, uh, but I believe that we can be very positive about this um, if we approach it in a uh, measured and systematic way. And I make one last plea. Apart from my other roles, I've got two boys at home, they're 22, and a daughter. Uh, and these young men were not around when uh, I was being asked what color my underwear was. They and many of their friends are horrified by what they hear about the behavior of other men. They really are. But sometimes they feel that they are also being generalized about uh, and put into the same category as others. Um, it seems to me, therefore, we must be careful when we're looking at perspectives um, to ensure that we listen to their voices too. It seems to me that the young men of today perhaps are going to be part of our salvation for the future. So let us listen, let us learn, let us not generalize, let us seek evidence so that we can then take proper action uh, and improve the lives of future generations. Thank you. Can I thank uh, all the panel for having shared your reflections, such um, rich, riches there, whilst being difficult, I think, to listen to at times. It was a, 
Uh, thank you very much for all that you shared. Uh, do please write your questions down. I'm going to ask somebody to start collecting them up. Um, that would be great. <coughs> uh, just to say that Aisha, Aisha does need to go uh, at some point. It's not that she's walking out on us, but she's got proper work to be doing. So, <laughs> so we'll let you go. One of the themes that you've all picked up on is about power imbalance. And um, I think, Aisha, you, you rightly pointed to the fact that actually this is also about structural change, which sometimes can feel just enormous. But I wondered whether maybe one or two, two of you would like to reflect, what could we be doing that tries to, in a, in a sense, make the power imbalance much more visual? Because I, I recognize sometimes, you know, if I think of myself, I don't think I'm powerful. But obviously, I am powerful. But at times, I also know when I'm powerful. And that tendency within all, all of us sometimes, you know, to use that power. How do we begin to make that power imbalance in our world much more obvious. So yeah, uh, I think one of the things, and I've referenced it already, but as you say, we all have power mm. um, wherever we are in, in our organizations, careers, etc. cetera. Um, and I think it's easier for some groups to use that power um, as, opposed to, as, as opposed to others. And I think that's why I mentioned that we, we can all call bad out. behavior out. out. We all have a responsibility to call it out, particularly for those groups who, for whatever reason, maybe cultural, um, maybe you know, all, all sorts of reasons why they feel less able to do so. Uh, we need to act on their behalf. That would be my view. Aisha. Um, well, I think there's a couple of things. I think, first of all, it's really important if you do have a platform to, if you see somebody who's less powerful than you, that's having a difficult time to um, speak up for them or offer them support. But the other thing is sometimes, yes, you do have a woman or a minority in a position of power, but there's not a critical mass of those people. You're a kind of lone she-wolf, you know, in this. So suddenly you're in this quite vulnerable position as well. So the weight of your, the entire like sex of the world is on your shoulders. If you're a person of color, you're the entire weight of like all racism is on your shoulders, then you, you're put under the pressure where you have to speak out about it and you want to. But then of course, if you're a minority and you speak out about it, your card is marked as well. Let's not kid ourselves as well. People who speak out about this stuff, particularly if you're from a minority group, you don't tend to flourish in that organization. Look at all the people that have whistleblown mm. about wrongdoing and stuff. Mm. They don't go on to have hugely successful careers. They tend to stop right there in their tracks and become forever known as the person who called out mm. that bad behavior. So I do think until we have much more of a critical mass of balance in positions mm. of real power, it's still very difficult for that one, mm. you know, or that minority group mm. to bear all the responsibility. Actually, the responsibility goes to the wider good point you were making in terms of the, the more dominant group to, mm. to sort of speak up for that, for that. But then that's difficult because mm. if you're not from that, if you don't, you know, that expression of walking in someone's shoes, mm. if you haven't really had the ability to really experience that, it's very hard for you to, mm. to sort of call that out. So that's why I'm very, very passionate about it. And it's quite unpopular. A lot of people don't like it and moan and groan about it. But my own experience in the Labour Party, until we introduced positive action and all women shortlists, and targets about getting women into politics, we were being absolutely hopeless. Now, you can argue we still don't have a, a woman leader, and that's, that's very true. I'd like to see that go further. But I do think we should be looking at, ha at senior positions, um, you know, targets or quotas or something like that, because until you try and move the needle, I don't think this stuff is really going to change. Mm. And, and I also, I know, uh, Kate, you made the comment, because also um, the issue I, I recognise is, is also race, but also social class. And we often forget, I don't know, in, in, how do we address that, that issue? I mean, I, in, you know, of where the power imbalance is about class, which we are less likely to talk about. Can I make a, a point mm. about power imbalances, though, um, which is this, that... There will, always, there will always be power imbalances because that is the way that the, the world is. And, and um, you know, a bishop has power, um, a judge has power, um, a broadcaster has a great deal of power, anybody who can write, you know, lecturers, all, all of us in our own fields, and I'm sure everybody here, in some shape or form has power in their lives. 
And, and the question is, it seems to me that it's not so much a question of, the, 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 of necessarily a, um, having um, a shift and having different people holding the power, because there will always be a temptation if you have a position of power to misuse it, whether knowingly or not. And it seems to me, therefore, that people need to have a great, a great deal more awareness of, of power imbalances. Some people who hold power don't even realize that they are misusing it. Um, it seems to me, therefore, it's a question um, partly of, of awareness and education um, I in all of us. It's an ethical issue. I just make one point mm -hmm. on that. I, I do hear that argument a lot, but take something like the example of Naga Manchetti. She's a pretty powerful broadcaster. She made a comment about Donald Trump, which her white male colleague had also made, and there was a complaint made against her, and it was upheld by an executive committee mm -hmm. mainly made up... <coughs> of white people, mainly white men. And it wasn't until there was a hue and cry in the media. She was silenced, mm. even though she's a powerful person. BME people in the BBC were told to not tweet about this, to not talk about this. Other people had to do it. And it wasn't until there was such a hue and cry about it that it was becoming a huge reputational issue where Tony Hall had to intervene and kind of overturn this decision. So that sort of doesn't, you know, she is a woman who is, yes, from the outside, looks like she's got a lot of power, but she's in a structural institution where her seniors basically threw her under the bus. Yes, and they, and they misused their power. Mm. But she has a... And I, as a broadcaster, I know that if I say certain things on air, I'm not going to get work again. So I do think, again, because the powers that be in a lot of these organisations are not balanced. I would say though that, that oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Ginny. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I would say though that that demonstrates the importance of um, of getting uh, allies who have power. So whether or not we we believe or understand that we have power individually, clearly the past few decades have shown that there has been a shift in attitudes towards women, even though it's still terrible. And it's a lot different now than it was 30 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And how has that change happened? That's, that change has happened through individuals making change, but also individuals using their own voices and power um, to change the structures that have an impact on all of us. And those structures are um, full of powerful people. I think often what has led to um, real change is convincing often white men in power that there needs to be change. So there's a real importance of allyship and making sure that it's not just individuals, the individual survivors or the individual women who are experiencing this, but we have to convince the people with the power as well. I've got um, a question from somebody who's put here and it <coughs> picks up a bit on this. In what ways can senior male leaders be most effective in facilitating and empowering women's rights and safety in the workplace? What, what could we be asking them to do? Katie, I um, I think I, I, I think it is a matter of giving power to different people. I really think it's about, um, about hiring different people. Um, I work in a Russell Group institution and um, they're notoriously white. We're in the middle of, in the process of trying to like diversify um, curriculums across um, curricula across um, um, Russell Group institutions. And actually that's, <laughs> that, that becomes a, a really difficult, doesn't it? Because you've got a group of white people, mainly middle class and above, trying to diversify the things that they teach. Well, that's, that's bonkers. That's bonkers. And that, that is part of, of the problem. So what would be, and that's also helping to maintain white supremacy in itself, because why is it that Russell Group institutions have got mainly white students and mainly white staff? Well, that's not because there's any difference in, it's not like you can say, you know, like you, you very often hear, oh, well, We've got a manual, but that's because <laughs> not very many women work in this field. Or we did ask women, but they were just too busy. They're just not doing it. You know, these excuses that we hear for why we're not, we haven't got the representation that we need. And I think that representation is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly powerful. Seeing people like you in positions and having people with different experiences, especially people who have experienced 
um, discrimination and people who have experienced difficulties, then that means that they'll lead in a different way. So I think it is about giving different people power. It's about making sure that we hire different people. And there are all sorts of ways that institutions can avoid doing that, including you know, the very famous, not a good fit, mm. which means that you're not saying anything that you're going to get sued for. Nobody's going to take you to, to a tribunal, but that's a coverall, because that can mean they're a bit rough, don't think they're going to fit in our institution, don't like the way they talk, um, could be not keen on the way that they look, they're not going to fit in our institution, could be, oh, well, we know they're a, a bit of a complainer, mm. we don't want, a bit dangerous, we don't want them, we'll use the not a good fit thing. Well, I think it's time that we made the fit a bit broader. And yes, I think that we, we need to work much harder at looking at how we are protecting and maintaining discrimination. So, Katie, in your work around organisational change, what are the sort of, uh, you know, what's the key intentional levers that could change that? Um, I think it's, if, if this is a priority, if people really mean it, they treat it as any other kind of business priority. So, you, you should mention this earlier, you'd set targets. You know, if you're really serious about bringing women up or minorities up, where are you now and where do you need to be in five years' time? Mm -hmm. Companies do it with profits and <laughs> all sorts of other kind of key, key, you know, key priorities, mm -hmm. key metrics. So I think it's it's setting targets, it's having a plan on how you're going to deliver them, and it's not rocket science. It really isn't rocket science. It just requires the will, the collective will, to change things, and that's when it becomes quite uncomfortable. Actually, mm -hmm. when um, there's a realization that this is quite fundamental change to how we've always done things, and people like to have routines and habits and. Um, and feel very comfortable. Mm. Um, I think the, the other realisation, and I, I mentioned it earlier, is, is realising, I think with a lot of kind of diversity, gender diversity or racial di diversity interventions, there's always this presumption that you've got to change the minorities or change the women mm -hmm. to enable them to fit in. Mm. But I think, you know, what we now know is that's, if you, if you change people, you've got no diversity. Mm. Um, so you've actually kind of undermined the very essence of the value that you're looking for. Mm. Um, so actually, you know, the world is changing. Organisations need to change. Mm. And that means culturally change. So everyone does feel they do fit, mm. whatever that means. Mm. Yep. Um, but they belong there. And, th and they are valued there and they're respected there for being authentic in themselves. Thank yeah. you. Uh, we're, we we're, we're sitting here in St Paul's Cathedral, a, a place of faith. I wonder whether... Um, you know, maybe Sarah or Katie you, or any of you may comment about what, what do you think that, you know, the Christian faith has to say to this? What does your academic study of the Bible, Katie, have to say to into this uh, discussion? Um, well, I run um, a research project with, um, with colleagues at the University of Leeds and the University of Auckland in New Zealand called the Shiloh Project. And that project looks at the Bible, religion and rape culture, both looking at how sexual violence is um, discussed in the Bible and in the <coughs> interpretation and in um, scholarship, but also how the Bible's used in contemporary culture to uh, resist or justify um, sexual violence. We've seen that a lot in the US with various senators and indeed with, um, the, with President Trump, um, where the Bible is, is consistently being used as a, as a tool for justification of really appalling, appalling behavior. Um, I think the really, the thing that keeps coming up, we've, we've, um, we're working with the University of Botswana at the moment and looking at um, the use of the Bible in churches and how the Bible is being, is being talked about in sermons, particularly around um, how women should respond to sexual violence. Um, now, I think that the things we've seen there are exactly the same kind of things, the, the, the same kind of issues that we see in the UK. And that is a real kind of lack of critical thinking and a real kind of squeamishness around um, texts that are scripture for some groups, a real, a real concern around speaking critically. I don't mean obviously speaking negatively. I mean thinking analytically and critically about what the text is saying and who is using the text and why they're using the text. And 
you know, whose interests are being served when this text is brought out in a sermon or in a discussion group. Um, and also, you know, really importantly, you know, which texts are picked out for discussion and which are kind of ignored. Um, my first year students are always astonished when we discuss texts like um, Judges 19, where there's a gang rape, for example, mm. or um, some of the porno prophetic literature. And really interestingly, there's, well, I say interesting, that's, a, that's always a euphemism, isn't it? It's very interesting to note that um, there's sometimes like this very strong sense in how we look at sexual violence in biblical texts. And we, we do it in a, in a very, um, we do it in a, in a really disappointing way. So we very often say, oh, well, that's the nasty Hebrew Bible, Old Testament God for you there. All the nasty stuff happens in the Old Testament. Ooh, angry, angry <laughs> God. Thank goodness we've got the New Testament that's beautiful and all forgiving, full of light. How great. So my, some, some, of, some students in some discussion groups tend to try and just kind of reduce the issue and say, oh, thank goodness we've worked it out. But actually, of course, mm. the New Testament has also got mm. issues in it. Mm. And, you know, you really run a risk if you try and say, oh, bad old Old Testament God, of being supersessionist and actually very close to being um, anti-Semitic. So <laughs> there's loads of, of issues um, and there's loads of things that, that we can do better um, including, I'm, I'm trying to work out how to do better every single day and discussion groups and students teach me how to do better every single day. So I think that's the thing. I think discomfort, that feeling of like, oh, I'm uncomfortable. Oh, that feeling of like, oh, I don't like what I'm being told. Mm. Um, that is really good. That's a good feeling to have. That's important because if we don't have that feeling, we're not learning and we're not changing. And so I don't like feeling uncomfortable like the next person, um, but I found that I start to worry if I don't feel uncomfortable because I feel like I'm not going anywhere and I really probably should get another job at the point when I'm not feeling uncomfortable anymore. <laughs> so that's what I would say. I'd say in all churches, we can just feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> that's great, that's, that's encouraging. Ginny, do you want to make a comment or Sarah? I mean. And I think... Uh, one thing to add is that just a recognition that um, the church, past, present, um, is, is kind of perpetuates patriarchal norms. Um, and it's not a thing of the past. It's not a thing of just the Old Testament. It's a thing of now. Um, how, what does church leadership look like? Um, how do we talk about women? How do church leaders talk about their wives? Um, how do we recognize that um, uh, sexual violence happens in churches too? Um, all these kinds of things are things that we need to talk about and bring to the surface rather than um, hide and think that it's an issue that's kind of out there. So mm -hmm. definitely mm. Um, self-reflection, I think the churches need to do. But, but the Bible also teaches us that many women are revered in the Bible. The first person to whom Jesus appeared and, and was asked, go and tell the others, was a woman. And so there are some um, patriarchal, definitely. Um, but I mean, the, the Bible is such a rich source of of um, learning and understanding, of perspective, of um, poetry, of history, of geography, of archaeology. Um, the Bible tells us all sorts of things, depending on the perspective, perspectives we adopt. Uh, and so I think it's, I think we must, um, again, view it in a very positive light. It depends oh, on I'm how we interpret it. <laughs> <laughs> I am an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. One, um, one last question, uh, and I think we, um, I think, Sarah, you, you began to touch on at the end. This issue, there is, um, the question is, is there a difference between generations? How do we encourage different generations to talk? Because, you know, or, or is it something that is an issue, will be an, is an issue across generations? Is this intergenerational issue? Well, it is, and I think we do need to encourage the generations to talk to each other. Um, when I sit at home, and many of you may be doing the same thing, um, I come from a large and close family, and we often have 10 people around a table from my 93-year-old father um, down to perhaps um, one of his grandchildren. And you hear these conversations going on um, about these issues, 
Um, the younger uh, men and women um, have a certain view. Um, you can, can imagine how a 93-year-old priest might have uh, uh, rather perhaps patriarchal views about other things. But, but when they talk in a, in a collegiate, sociable environment, um, you begin to see perspectives emerging. And so I do think it's not just a question of young people talking to each other, that they should talk to they should talk to us, us sort of older women. Um, they should talk to um, uh, uh, people much younger than they are. Um, they, they must explore. The moment, I think, the danger is that some of the younger people, especially younger men, are feeling somewhat um, put upon, uh, somewhat sort of corralled into um, a, a particular role or, or a, you know, a particular viewpoint is taken of them. And I do fear that there may be a... Uh, they'll have a, a sense of alienation in the end if they don't, if there isn't an intergenerational mm -hmm. conversation. All generations can learn from each other, as we know. And sometimes the young people teach the older people a great deal. And Ginny, that must be your experience, particularly in other, you know, in other countries, Kenya, Nigeria. Um, I think there is, um, I think what I want us to not forget in kind of look, I know that you were saying that your sons are kind of, um, very horrified by what happened before. We have to recognize that um, this generation is facing different challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I was on the bus the other day and I heard some young, boy, young teenagers talking and I was absolutely horrified by what they were saying. There were all sorts of different um, things that they face. Social media brings about new challenges, um, digital things like you know, Uber apps and there are new ways for um, sexual violence or sexual harassment to be um, continued. So we need to recognize that there's still a job to do. Um, I've got a two-year-old son. I pray to God that we're not having this conversation when he's mm. um, 18. I hope the world has changed by then. I think I'd go back to the point I made about awareness doesn't change anything. Mm. Um, and I think the case in point is the sexual violence on campus that you've referred to. I mean, you know, we do a lot of work with universities and you'd hope by now with the focus on diversity and inclusion, on Me Too, that there's, you know, there is so much awareness and it's just so disappointing. I mean, I'm a cup half or a glass, pref preferably a glass, half full person. Um, but, you know, you kind of want to drain your glass when you hear that there's still her sexual violence on, on campus when there really shouldn't be if insight and knowledge and awareness alone mm. would, would make people stop and think and change their behaviour. It doesn't. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm aware we're just coming to the end of our time. I'm very grateful for what you shared and also the discussion. But I wondered whether just to finish up, uh, I'm the Bishop of London. I'm a, in the House of Lords. Uh, I know I'm white <coughs> privileged and uh, I oversee a diocese where we don't have enough women uh, priests, nor do we have enough priests who are black, you know, Af African or Asian or any, you know, we don't. Um, and, I, and I also know that um, women can have a tough time in the diocese. Um, so what, what would you hope I take away from it, Sarah? Ooh, what do you want um, to give me? That what wasn't in the script, that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think um, you have huge insights and you do have huge influence. Um, I think use your authenticity and your passion and, and you can make a difference. But I think it's, you know, you, you know what needs to be done. You know what the, isu what the issues are that need to be addressed and they're not easy. Mm. Thank you, Ginny. I think that you, um, as someone in a position of power, are, you recognise the challenge that is ahead. You recognise where potentially power needs to be um, uh, shared more equally among people who uh, do not look like you. So I think that um, in recognising that, that's part of the, um, part of the journey. I think that what I'd want you to take away is that we have come a long way, um, but there is still a long way to go. I'd want you to take away a spirit of practical optimism. And when I say practical, I mean um, that we, we have to work out strategies, things that we're going to do, but on the basis that we, we, we can achieve things, but room was not built in a day. Um, the human uh, structures don't change in a day, but practical optimism. Thank you. Um, I would say the thing that's helped me the most, which has been be ready and willing to hear and listen to things that you really don't like. <laughs> um, and um, just, you know, listen rather than immediately dismissing or that age-old, notorious mm. white women's trick. If mm. you get called out, don't cry in mm. response. <laughs> Just <laughs> take it. 
I was really encouraged. It's all right to feel uncomfortable or <laughs> something. And would you join with me in thanking our panel? Thank <laughs> you.